Apparently, from all that I can gather anyway, the President of the United States, nor anyone in his trusted circle, has ever seen the movie A Few Good Men, because if they had, they would counsel the President to stop saying something, because it shows a duality of mind that is the death knell of any commander. Those of you who might not remember what the plot of the story was, the commander of the troops in Cuba got caught in a little bit of hypocrisy. And the reason most people couldn't see it is because they were caught up in their emotions. Now, this is, of course, battlefield of the mind. This is the idea that when people say things or do things that give you a good reason to be upset, perhaps it's a good choice to take a breath and think about things before becoming upset. If you would like to learn about the tactics and techniques that give you this advantage, love to have you over at the Florida Maquis Patreon channel. One U.S. dollar per month. The media especially doesn't want you learning this because they make their money. Their bread and butter relies on their ability to keep you in an emotional state while believing you are still thinking. Now, over there, it's only one U.S. dollar per month, to my mind, best investment you can make these days. But it's even less than a dollar a month if you sign up for an entire year and fully refundable, unlike the vast majority of things these days. First 90 days. Go kick the tires. Go check it out. It's not for you. You've got 90 days. you got all summer. And you can still get all of your entire $3 over three months back. No questions back. No, pardon me. No questions asked money back for sure. Now, what am I talking about? What should the president stop saying? For the umpteenth time, Joe Biden very recently has made this comment about quote unquote F-15s versus people having weapons. He said, and I'm paraphrasing here because he said it many different ways, those who say the blood of patriots, you know, and all the stuff about how we're going to have to move against the government, if you think you need to have weapons to take on the government, well, I'm telling you right now, you're going to need F-15s and maybe some nuclear weapons. What's the point he's making? The U.S. government feels absolutely no fear of the people whatsoever if they have AR-15s. Because their weaponry is so much uh, superior that you would present no threat. Well, some might ask, okay, I get that, Florida Maquis, but what does this have to do with a few good men? Well, who remembers the argument? Why the two orders? You see, in the movie, in the movie, there was an order given to move a soldier or in this case, a Marine, pardon me, to a separate facility because his life was allegedly in danger from other Marines because the guy was apparently substandard. But the colonel had also said that he gave an order that that Marine not to be touched, and his orders were always followed. So then, if you gave the order that the guy was not to be touched, why would his life have been in danger? So I ask again, Mr. Biden, with respect, sir, if your weaponry is so much superior to the just the average Joe with an AR-15, why do you need to confiscate it? If the AR-15 presents no threat to you because of your vastly superior aircraft, I mean, you left 300,000 of them behind for the Taliban, Apparently, you have no fear of them either. I mean, you have unending supplies of fuel and aircraft, and you can drop thousands, if not tens of thousands of men. Apparently, we would be absolutely no match for you whatsoever, right? Why would you need to confiscate the average Joe's weapons if we're no threat to you? And... Why do the opinions of other countries on this matter? Since clearly, if we're no threat to you, 
We couldn't possibly be a threat to them. Why would you care about their opinion? Now, I'm sure a lot of you are probably laughing and probably pounding your fist and saying, that's a great point. Because here's the real story. Not only has the president not watched a few good men, or he's forgotten, he's clearly not a student of history. The Royal Navy during the American Revolution, I don't normally read large articles like this, but five and a half minutes in, I think this is worth the read to show what the revolutionaries in North America were facing when they decided to stand up to Great Britain. You see, the disparity was even greater. The disparity between the average person living in the colonies, the 13 colonies, during the revolution, between them and the abilities of the British Royal Navy were comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges. The disparity was far greater then than it is even now. And yet, what do we know? Just going to read this. I'll go through this as quickly as I can and try to skip anything that doesn't matter, but let's go. At the outbreak of the American Revolution in 1775, the British Navy was the largest and most experienced navy in the world, and it was essential to the survival of the British Empire. At the start of the American Revolution, the Royal Navy numbered over 250 vessels of all size. These ranged from massive ships of the line to tiny sloops and coastal vessels. By the end of the war, that number would nearly double as the Navy expanded to meet the threat posed by other European powers fighting alongside the Americans. The Navy served as Britain's wooden walls, protecting the home islands from invasion by much larger continental powers. Britain also relied on her Navy to defend trade, flowing in from her far-flung colonies during the American Revolution. The Navy played a critical role in supporting the Army's attempt to crush the American Rebellion, allowing the Army to strike anywhere along the coast. In the later years of the war, the Navy would be crucial in holding off the French, Spanish, and Dutch as the war spread across the globe. Navy vessels were organized along a rating system that broadly defined their size and their use. At the top of the system were the first-rate ships, 100 guns. Now through this paragraph here, I'll give you the link. It gives you all of the, the breakdowns of everything that they had. But the most important thing to get down to is what did the colonists have? At the start of the American Revolution, the Royal Navy faced little opposition from the fledgling American Navy. Several colonies maintained small state navies, and in the 1775 Congress authorized the creation of a Continental Navy. These forces amounted to several dozen versus 500 that the British had small vessels and a handful of frigates. Unable to face the Royal Navy in open combat, See, they had no F-15s or nuclear weapons either. The Americans preyed upon British merchant shipping. They were soon joined by over a thousand privateers, private vessels authorized to attack enemy ships. Over the course of the war, over 2,000 British merchant ships were captured, a factor that helped to turn British public opinion against the war. Now this gives you a hint as to how a good insurrection should operate. Because... It hits the British where it hurts. How do you operate a navy of that much without money? And we're going to get into something else after we talk about this um, that goes right along with it. In fact, let's go there now. Some time ago, I put up this meme. And meme or picture or whatever you want to call it. Patriot Nurse said something incredibly incredibly prescient in one of her short videos and immediately brought to mind a New Testament scripture. It says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. Now, Patriot Nurse, in one of her shorts, talks about people leaving. In fact, that's what she leaves with, pardon me, leads with here. She says, people are going to leave, but from that point, I want you to hear it in her voice. I'm 
are lots of places that you can go in this world. And, you know, I really don't, I don't fault people for it. I know a lot of people might say like, oh, it's anti-American to leave. No, I'll tell you what's anti-American, capitulating to a government whose taxes are tyrannical. That's anti-American. And you gotta ask yourself, like if you wanna live compatibly with your principles, if your principles are low taxation, freedom from tyranny, freedom from government, then this iteration of the United States is the furthest thing from American that you could possibly think of. Uh, it, is, it is woefully inept and is increasingly becoming more and more invasive and oppressive to people. This is oppressive taxation. When it costs more to pay off the tax man than it does to feed, clothe, and care for yourself, that is tyranny. And those taxes are how they pay for the F-15s, for the nuclear weapons. Now, let's dovetail right down to the next line of thought on this. Who remembers when Donald Trump said, I have a great history of paying my bills on time, but you're right. If somebody does a poor job, I'm not the quickest to pay. But if they do a good job, I pay them. He said again, reiterating this point when people brought him to task for not paying certain bills. If a contractor doesn't do a good job, if they don't do the work, I'm the first to admit that I'll hold back and I'll settle with them. I'll pay them, but I'll settle with them. Now, isn't that... A lot of people are like, 11 and a half minutes in, what is this, how is this relevant to anything going on? What did they go after Mr. Trump for? Tax fraud, business fraud. What did they go after Biden's son for? They're getting ready to, I should say. After the gun charge, it's evading taxes and not paying taxes. You see, they're telegraphing to you what their real weakness is. But the question is, have they done a good job? Or do they deserve to be settled with and withheld from? You see, that's something else the Patreoners talked about, about the idea of paying taxes to a tyrannical, oppressive government that uses your tax money to oppress you and then wants to disarm you in the same breath they say that your arms are no threat to them. In the same breath that they say that your arms are no threat to them, they want to then disarm you. Here's the question we really need to be asking. How many of you know what a fiduciary duty is? Does the U.S. government have a fiduciary duty to do with our money what is in our best interest? See, if they want to go after people for taxes, okay, we need to go after them for their money managing breach of fiduciary duty is a big deal and a crime and it could very well be alleged that the U.S. government is in breach of their fiduciary duty to the taxpayer to use our money in our best interest. The six different types of fiduciary duty could easily be proven to have been violated over the last 50 to 100 years. Duty of care, loyalty, good faith, confidentiality, prudence and disclosure, especially disclosure with no audit of the Fed. Especially that. This would have hit them where it hurts. You see, there's this idea. People love talking about capitalism and U.S. oil and making America great, all this kind of stuff. These corporations in the United States have no fiduciary duty to you and me. They only have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders. They couldn't give a crap less if their decisions are bad for the American people or not. Because there's no legal mechanism by which you could hold them to account for that. Capitalism being the extraordinary belief that the nastiest of men, greediest of men, for the nasty of motives will somehow work together for the benefit of all, including buying politicians with that money. You see, shouldn't it be the idea that the government has a duty to make sure that when the average American goes to the grocery store, it's not one of those catastrophic events that could cost them a car payment, could cost them a lapse in insurance, could cause them to lose their home or not pay rent that month. 
You see, I made this allegation, bothered a lot of people about this idea of capitalism versus socialism and how does not a mother have a fiduciary duty to her family and to do whatever is necessary? If you believe in capitalism, you will do whatever is necessary before turning to the government. You will do, ladies, pay attention. You will do whatever is necessary before turning to the government for benefits to feed your family, right? Used to care what people thought about me till one day I tried to pay my bills with their opinions. You see, in other countries that get derided and made fun of for being evil, terrible, horrible socialist countries, PDVSA, Petro Ecuador, Aramco, Pemex, Petrobras, and Petro Peru are state-run oil companies that have a fiduciary duty not to turn a profit, not to do what's best in the interest of a handful of shareholders. Their job is to pump oil out of the ground to benefit the people of Venezuela, Ecuador, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, Brazil, and Peru, respectively. We don't have that here. We don't have that here because somebody would cry socialism and then talk about something that happened 150 years ago in some other country under basically what was tyranny at the time, not socialism, and then say, unless you want to turn out like that country, but now this is what you get. This is what you get. We have a government now whose fiduciary duty isn't to you. It isn't to you. And they have no problem being dual-minded, saying one in one breath, you're absolutely no threat whatsoever to us. I don't know why you would even want an AR-15, because you couldn't do anything with it, because we have F-15s and nuclear weapons. And then in the other breath, say, well, you're so much of a threat with that weapon, we need to confiscate it. And nobody sees it. Why the two orders? Why the two contradictory orders? This is what happens in tyranny. Some might might ask the question about... Uh, let's see if I can find it here. Why were the uh, colonists such a problem for Great Britain? You see, you could ask yourself that question... Why did the, the British government feel that what was happening in the colonies was such a threat to their global interests? I mean, there was a saying at one time that the sun never set on the British Empire because it was so large, and that was true. So why were those few little pesky colonies over there, farmers with pitchforks, as uh, Colonel, uh, no, pardon me, Lord, uh, Lord Cornwallis said, they're, they're just farmers with pitchforks. Why were they such a threat? Because what Great Britain saw was that they were going to have a massive financial ability to bring to bear very soon. And it's that financial part that people need to focus on. And that's why I shared that little clip from the Patriot Nurse, because she hit on it. The oppressive taxation has a purpose. They need the free flow of money, and that is into their coffers. That is exactly why. That's what they got Capone for. This is the real threat to them. This is the real threat. The money. So I will leave it there. Just something to ponder and something to think about. But once again, God bless all of you. Thank you so much for showing up at the Patreon channel. Like I said, I know things are tough. That's why I have it set at the lowest level possible. If they would allow me to set it at 50 cents a month, I would set it at 50 cents a month. If they would allow it at a quarter, I'd put, put down 25 cents. Whatever the speed bump is, is the only reason I have it there. And that's it.
God bless. Pray for each other. Pray for me. I'll pray for you. Lift each other up. Like, share, subscribe. I'll see you guys next time.